Amen. Thanks, Nate. Yeah. Just want to pray for these guys right now and for their ministry. Take a second and uh, just silent your heart and just see what the Lord gives you to pray for them. Uh, this is an awesome ministry, the op opportunity here to fulfill the words of Jesus when he said, I didn't come for those who are well, but for those who are sick, right? And that's all of us. It just looks different down there. Uh, obviously, there's some really dark things going on down there, some oppression, some demonic activity, but uh, God's arm is not too short and his ear is not too dull to hear when we cry out. So let's take a moment to pray for them. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, asking you for your blessing on this ministry, God. Thank you for the men and women that will walk those streets, proclaiming the goodness of Christ, your son. And Father, we pray for an anointing of the Holy Spirit as they walk through there, God, that you would give them words of wisdom and words of knowledge. God, that you would give them prophetic words. God, as they preach the gospel, we pray that uh, miraculous healings would take place. God, we pray for the gift of helps there. Uh, just as he was talking about Robert being in an SRO, God, I pray that there would be times of just being with people and helping them and loving them, God. God, I pray against the heart and mentality that they are a savior. You are the savior, God. So we pray against a hero complex here. God, we pray that their work would be done, not letting the left hand know what the right hand is doing. God, we pray against that attitude of taking um, pats on the back or patting themselves on the back. But I pray for pure motives. We pray for the heart to be pure, God, to exalt your name, Jesus, and to bring healing to the oppressed, to set the captive free, God. God, we just pray now that you would just release power through these men. Holy Spirit, resurrection power through these men and women that walk these streets, God. Lord, we pray for the miracles, even the raising of the dead. God, we want to pray big this year, and we want to see you move, Lord. God, so I just pray now in Jesus' name that all this would come forth. All of your blessings would come forth, God. And Lord, I, I remember when I came here, they said, if we walk these streets and these projects for five years and only one comes, it's worth it. God, so it's you that gives the increase. One sows and one waters, and they're the same, God. But it's you that brings them. So Jesus, we commit this to you. Do your work that you only do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I, I wanted to share something. Um, and I think it falls in line kind of with the kind of some of the things that you guys said that you see down there in the tenderloin. And, and a lot of us in this room have been down there and done outreaches and ministry. And I can't tell you how many times I've stopped and talked to people that are wonderful people that are about to shoot up. And they're shooting up right in front of me. And they're just, and I'll talk to them and I'll ask them their names and I won't just go and Bible thump them and say, here's the gospel, swallow it. It's not that, it's talking with people and saying, hey, where are you from and what was your life like and what, did you, what was your passion and what hope do you have left? And as they share their stories, come to find out that many of them sat in pews just like these for a lot of their life. Many of them are children of pastors. Many of them have walked with God before and can quote more scripture than any of us in this room. That's probably surprising, but that's the truth of it. And you know, and I think about like, why is that? And why is it that we ourselves in our ministry, as we do ministry like we do in homes and our relationships are super close, that we see people walking with God and loving God. And then the next day they're gone. After a year or two years of doing great, and you see God doing miraculous work in their life. They're gone. Why is that? And I think one of the things that I've discovered this year that the Lord has shown me, and I feel like it's for this church to hear, one of the things that hinders people from coming closer to God and walking in all the fullness that he has for us is unforgiveness. This here is a barrier. And I think even in this room, there's unforgiveness in some of our hearts. I can't tell you how real this message is for me right now. I can't tell you how good God has been 
The word of God says that it is the patience and the kindness of God that leads to repentance. Don't take that lightly. Don't think it's you yourselves that chose to do something good. It's God's goodness that led any one of us to repentance. That's a heavy statement there. We don't get to take credit for that. And so I want to share a little bit of my history and uh, kind of my life and some of my mom and, and my story because it's a wonderful story. It's a hard story. And, you know, I was in the office the other day and I was just sharing with a couple guys, a couple of the elders, and uh, they're like, yeah, how was your, how was your Christmas break and how did it go? And, 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 you know, I just started sharing. And after we were done, it was like, well, we got we to gotta get that message out. And I was like, if I try to tell it again, it just won't come out. It's for moments like these when it's intimate, when it's a few people and God gets to affect it. It just effectively uses that. But I'm going to give it a shot anyway. So I'm, I'm just going to, let's do it. You know, I, I feel like it's just so good. And so growing up, I had one brother. And my mom and dad, uh, you know, born into, you know, just like the rest of us, depravity. Got involved in drugs and, and violence and alcohol and all that stuff. And very abusive my father was to my mother and they both went to prison when we were just little boys. My brother was probably two and I was probably one and maybe, I don't know, right around there, but that was my earliest memory as a child. And I remember it was Easter day and you know, I just remember the cops coming and taking my dad away. I thought they took my mom away too until she told me, actually, no, I didn't go to jail that day. <laughs> Your dad went to jail and I said, well, I remember both of you guys going. And so my grandmother raised us and she's a wonderful woman. She's a Catholic woman, and she did the best she could. But, you know, boys uh, born in that kind of life usually end up following the same footsteps as their parents. And uh, we did. And we went hard. And we got involved in gangs and drugs and in violence. And uh, by the age of, uh, I was 15 turning 16, and my brother was one year older than me. And he got kidnapped, and he got murdered, and, uh, and he, got dumped, he got dumped in a garbage can, you know? And we found him the next day, the police found him, and, uh, and it, was, it, it broke my heart because he was my only brother, and we're just like super close, you know, and that, that tore me open, you know? And my life took a turn for the worst. And uh, hatred, bitterness, all the things that come with that, the enemy loves to do, uh, just work through my life for so many years. And, um, you know, I just, I lived that way for a long time, in and out of prisons, and uh, fifth time going to prison is where God finally got a hold of my heart. So many people would walk the streets in the neighborhood sharing the gospel with me and, and saying, you know, Jesus is good and he'll save you if you confess and repent, call him Lord. And I was like, I respected them. I said, hey, that's awesome, you know, but that's not for me. I just knew what I was, and uh, but God had a plan. And the last time I went to prison, he got a hold of my heart. and. Uh, just in a moment transformed me and he gave me eyes to see and ears to hear and a heart to understand and I don't know how he did that you know I couldn't explain it if I wanted to all I know that I was in solitary confinement and uh, and I was reading that scripture that says blessed are the poor in spirit for this is the kingdom of God and I said that doesn't make sense at all <laughs> how could you be uh, the kingdom of God belong to you if you're poor in spirit and I, I read the little commentary and it basically said those who are spiritually bankrupt. And I don't know why God chose that moment, but he tore open my heart and I believed that that was me. And everything that I'd ever done, and I'd done a lot of dirt in my life, uh, everything that I ever did was right before me. And so was Jesus. And uh, Jesus gave me a new heart that moment. And, and somehow he gave me the opportunity to say, you know what, the thing that hurt me the most in life, which was probably my brother uh, being murdered, in that cell, I remember saying, God, I forgive them. I forgive the people who killed my brother. I just, I don't know how. I knew that I was supposed to forgive him or the people who did it. I just knew it. Um, so that was a process that began, you know. So fast forward, here I am, you know, we are church eight years later, you know. Um, and last year, you know, in October, September actually, uh, something really devastating happened. You know, and you guys know the story of what happened with Andrew and he murdered his grandmother. And he's a very good friend of mine. And he was part of my church for a while, but he walked away. And every time he walked away, he walked away with bitterness. He walked away with, you know, this critical spirit. He walked away 
isolation and all these things that are not of God. And when I talked to him, the root of it was unforgiveness all the time. You know, there was things that he had against his family. And so after that happened, I talked to him again over the phone while he's in jail. And we're talking about the people that he hadn't forgiven. And, and you know, he's trying to forgive them over the phone. He's facing life now for killing his grandma. And coming out of that, I said, you know what? I talked to my wife and people around me and I said, you know what? I just got to make sure that there's total forgiveness. Every stone has to be turned over. And I started studying stuff and reading and I started saying, you know what? This is a root. This is a thing that causes people who love God and who read his word every day and who pray every day to go another way. This is something, this is the foothold that scripture talks about. You know how scripture says, don't give the enemy a foothold? This is that thing. And so I just started saying, you know what, we need, to, we need to forgive. Like, I started confessing stuff to my wife and saying, hey, forgive me and her to me. And, and just everybody was around. Let's just get it all out. Let's get it all out and lay it at the foot of the cross. And so I was going um, around the same time that Andrew reached out to me. My daughter reached out to me. And she's not forgiven me for going in and out of prison. And somehow God put those two people at the same time in my life to begin a relationship again. And uh, so I was on my way down to LA to visit her and I hadn't seen her in years. You know, I, I, when I got out, I tried to go to her graduation ceremony and she hadn't seen me in years. And she was so hurt by me that uh, she actually walked out of her high school graduation and left. Like she is hurt. And all I want for her is to be able to forgive. You know, with my mom and my dad, both of them, somehow the Lord gave me the grace to forgive them. I love my mom. I love my dad. They're not there yet. <laughs> they're, they're, they're still working on that process. But for me and them, like, we have a great relationship. And I want that for my daughter. You know, my dad never was around in my life. And when I was in prison this last time, he contacted me and said, hey, I'm dying. I got about a few months left. My liver's done. I need, a, I need a, somebody to give a whole liver and a small intestine valve and all that, and it's not gonna happen. So I wanna come and see you and make amends. He's, he's been clean for about 20 something years and doesn't use or anything anymore. He's not the same guy. And so he came and I remember sitting in the, in the, in the visiting room with him. And he says, hey son, I wanna apologize to you for never being there for you. He goes, I, I, I wanna tell you sorry for not being a dad to you. And I remember opening up to this passage in Matthew 6. And I was a brand new believer, you know, I was a brand new believer, I didn't, just like, all right, here's what it says, I just know it has to be. And I opened up Matthew 6, and if you turn there with me, and I was reading this again this morning, just to kind of refresh, and, um, and you guys know the Lord's Prayer. You guys probably said it growing up like crazy, and, but just the part in there, and I'm just gonna read it in Matthew 6, and it says, Jesus, when his disciples ask him, hey, Teach us how to pray. He says, don't do this, don't do that, but do this. He says, so don't be like them. For your Father knows what you need before you ask. Pray then in this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive also those who owe us debts. And so there you see we're asking God to forgive us in the same way that we forgive others. The same measure that we give to others is the same measure that God will forgive us. I don't know if that's absolutely right, but it just made sense to me. And then the next thing that he says, he, he closes it off and he says, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And then after that, he goes in, for if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your father will not forgive your transgressions. And so I read that to my dad and I said, hey, you are forgiven and I love you. We're good. And that was just the beginning. That was just me saying it, right? And uh, the process started. We started to build a relationship. He ended up moving to Nebraska from California, which is kind of by Kansas where I was at. And God just used that time to build our relationship and forgiveness took place. And there was so much freedom for me in that with my dad. Now fast forward, here we are, and we are church, and I think uh, as I go to LA, I'm visiting my daughter, 
And before I visit my daughter, I pick up my mom, and I'm still fresh with that thing with Andrew, right? I'm still thinking, man, every we got to forgive. And I'm like, hey, mom, uh, let's pray, and let's just start forgiving people. And, and so what I do is I, I get her in the car, and we drive to a spot. And before we get there, I say, hey, do you know where we're at right now? And she's like, no. And I said, right here around the corner is the place they dumped my brother's body. And my mom's never been able to look at a picture of my brother after that happened. Um, guilt, shame, all the things that the enemy wants to bring for her and my dad not being there for us. It's just, she can't look at the picture and I'm saying, mom, we need to be able to forgive. And I'm just ministering to her and telling her how important forgiveness is. And I say, mom, will you go there with me right now and pray and forgive these people? And I, I know this is the kindness and the patience of God. They gave her the ability to say, yeah, I'll go there with you. And she just dropped her head and just started crying. And she said, I'll go. Let's go. And so we pull up and we get off the car. And uh, and she's just bawling. She's crying. And she's losing it. And I just grab her hands. And we just start praying. And I just start saying, God, we just forgive the people who did this. We don't know who it was. But God, we pray for their souls. We pray for their children. We pray against any curses that have brought on their lives because of this. And then she starts praying it. And then she starts praying to forgive my dad. My dad in their day, like, man, he's treated my mom horribly. She got all her teeth knocked out by him. He's not the same guy anymore, but he was a horrible guy to her. And she's forgiving him for everything. And she says, I forgive him, God. I forgive my brother. I forgive my uncle. All the people that have hurt her. And she's been so many hurts in her life. And she's just releasing that. And I'm going to tell you guys, like, there is cosmic things going on at that moment. There is a breakthrough at that moment. I know it's falling like, well, that's kind of cool. It's happening, right? I'm telling you, like, the heavens were open at that moment. I know that in my soul. I know that in my heart. It wasn't just words coming out. There was cosmic things happening in that moment as forgiveness was happening. And we left there. And as we drove away, I was like, dang, that was amazing. That was probably one of the craziest things I've done. As a believer, is walk with my mom through forgiveness. And we're driving down there in L.A. And then I see a spot. And I'm like, wait, that was my aunt's house work. And I remembered something that happened to me there as a child. And where sexual sin came in. And we got off. And I stood in front of the house. And we said, we just claim the blood of Jesus over this house and over our lives. And we claim victory. What the enemy tried to take away, we claim victory right now in the name of Jesus. We pray against sexual sin, and I'm just standing there just shouting victory in Jesus. What you try to take, God has restored and glorified his name in me, his child. And we went to the next place. We're driving over like, here's another spot. And then all of a sudden, we're in a different city, and I'm driving, and I look, and I'm like, it's an empty lot right there. And all I, re I remember right at that moment that where that empty lot was was a hotel. And that's my first memory as a child. And we got off and I said, hey, you know what we're doing here? And she goes, I know this place. This is where your dad went to prison. And I, this is my first memory as a child. And I just started forgiving her and my dad. I don't, just The Lord was just guiding us through repentance and forgiveness. This is what it says. If you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. And by his grace and by his love for me and my mom, he allowed us to go to each one of those places and say, no, nah, we forgive and we claim victory over these things. A couple weeks later after I left home and came home and told the story to some people and Peter was actually with me down there and uh, we talked all the way up. I'm like, dude, that was epic. That was crazy. Like the Lord was all over it. And we came back and I talked to my mom a couple weeks later. And every time I talked to my mom, she was crying. Ah, you know, and it's like, and she's just different. There's just something different about her. There's hope. There's joy. It's a different person. And she says, Mijo, you know what? I went to the doctors the day, and you know what they told me? My hepatitis is in remission. And I knew at that moment. I knew at that moment what it was. Doctors could tell me different. You can tell me different. But I knew that through forgiving, there was physical healing. A manifestation of the Spirit of God comes with that. You see that some of you right here in this room are sick and are weary and are tired and are broken and keep going back to your vices and can't forgive. It's a barrier. You're not walking in all that God has for you. 
You're not walking in the fullness of what God has for you. I don't know if it's your spouse. I don't know if it's your children. I don't know if it's when you were a baby and a kid. But you need to forgive. It's not optional. It is commanded. It is commanded. The Lord God has said you need to forgive. This is where we get to be like him. If you want to be like Jesus, oh, we're hands and feet of Jesus. We give food away. We do this. Jesus forgave on the cross. He said, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. When Stephen was being martyred, he said, forgive them. If you want to be conformed to the image of Christ, dig deep in there and start looking. I want to read a few passages of scripture. This way it's not just my word saying, hey, forgive. So after that happened, you know, um, I went back and I went back to LA again. I visited my mom. She's totally different. It's changing her. And doors are opening now with my daughter for her to forgive me. And she just calls out of nowhere and says, Dad, I love you and I need you in my life. She did not want nothing to do with me. God just starts opening doors. And I kept striving for that door to open. But it's when forgiveness started to happen that doors started to open. And I, I just want to read these passages of scripture before we go any further. I jotted them down this morning. This is God's heart. The Lord our God is merciful and forgiving, even though we have rebelled against him. It's Daniel 9 9. Isaiah 38 17. Lo, for my own welfare I had great bitterness. It is you who has kept my soul from the pit of nothingness, for you have cast all my sins behind your back. Thank you, Lord. Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Isaiah 118. Ephesians 1 7. In, we, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin in accordance with the riches of God's grace. This is God's heart. This is how he forgives. And now I want to share some scriptures with you that call you to forgiveness. So you don't say, oh, well, that's good for God. He's awesome. He's God. Well, God commands that you forgive. He doesn't say, hey, when you feel better or when you feel like you might want to. I think even as I was sharing the story with Francis, he's like, we're just praying. And he's like, I repent. God, I repent before you right now that giving people the idea that they can forgive when they're ready. Because that's what the world tells you. When you're ready to forgive, it'll come. And I've said that out of my own mouth. The world will tell you, oh, you need to forgive yourself. Oh, you need to forgive God. That's not Bible. That's not God's word. That's philosophy. That's man-made stuff. The Lord says you will forgive. Ephesians 4, 31 and 32. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you. Along with all malice, be kind to one another. Tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Imperative, command. It's not optional, guys. Doesn't matter how bad it hurts, you need to forgive. Next one is um, Matthew. We read this one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Think about Jesus saying in John 8, 7, when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, if any one of you is without sin, let him be the first one to throw the stone. All of us, all of us have sinned against the Holy God. We are required to forgive others. It's not optional. And so I want to, I want to just say, guys, the ministry that you're doing right now, some of you guys are pastors in this room and Leaders, the ministry that you're doing right now, you are encountering people that love God and are reading their Bible every single day and they're praying their hearts out, but they're not free. This is one of the reasons why. 
because forgiveness isn't taking place and they will walk away. Until you learn to lead people in this, into forgiveness, they'll be stuck. And that's some of you in this room. And so I want to open it up right now for a time. I want some of the pastors to come up. And I just want you guys to, if there's an offense against your brother in this room, or against your sister, or if you offended, scripture says to leave your stuff there at the altar and go make right, be reconciled. There was a few years, or a couple years back, we were in this very room, and we sat here, and it felt like a word came from the Lord that we needed to repent and forgive each other. And so that night, we all just started going up to each other and saying, hey, I was offended by you, and I forgive you, you know, and just letting it all out, laying it all out. And tonight, we're going to do that again. We're going to make sure that there's nothing hindering us going into 2018. And some of this stuff has to take time. It's a process, right? It's a process, but we want to start tonight. So if there's sin that you're carrying, if there's bitterness that you're carrying, we want to lay it at the foot of the cross tonight. There's another scripture I want to read, and it's not on this list. In Hebrews 12, 15. The scripture talks about bitterness, you know, because when unforgiveness, it's a spirit almost of unforgiveness. It's a curse. You walk in that. You carry that when you allow that to take place because God's law is forgive. When he says something, it has to be done. And when you don't obey it, what happens? He disciplines those he loves. You bring cursings on yourself. You open that door. For bitterness, and when bitterness takes place, all kinds of stuff comes with it. Resentment, self-pity, isolation, all these things are spiritual things. All of it. And so with Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 12, we're on here. Let's start putting those little bookmarkers on there. So 12.15, I feel like reading all of 12 almost, but I'm not. I'll just start in Hebrews 12.12. 12. It says, therefore strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble and make straight path for your feet so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather healed. It says, pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness spring up, causing trouble, and by it many be defiled. When this root of bitterness takes place, especially for leaders, it doesn't just affect you. It defiles many around you. Some of you are parents. It defiles your children. It comes right into their hearts. You might think, hey, I got something against my spouse. That's, that's between me and my husband or my husband and my wife. That's between us. It pours into your children. That root of bitterness defiles all around you. It affects people. When you're leading people in that condition, it affects the other people that you're leading. It's a spiritual thing. It's not a do better. It's not I'm going to be morally good and just say, hey, I'm all right. It's a spiritual thing, and we've got to lay these things at the cross. One more part of the story that I'll share. My mom is, uh, by God's grace, she broke her collarbone. <laughs> That's, I know it sounds weird, but she's in, she needs help. So she just moved up here yesterday, and she's here now, and she's ready to sit down with my dad and forgive my dad after all these years. She's ready to have a meal with him and say, I forgive you because God's forgiven me. And... So there's freedom and forgiveness, guys. And I just put that out there because if anybody has a right to hold on to things, I think she's been hurt a lot more than I have, and I've been hurt a lot. But she's not willing to. She sees this. She sees this. She says, I have to do it. And I want that for you guys. I want that for this church. So I want to take some time right now, and I want to ask a couple pastors to come up.
and be willing to pray for people. And I want you guys to come up and confess. If there's any unforgiveness in your life, lay it at the foot of the cross tonight. Get rid of it. If there's somebody in this room that you need to forgive, that you've been offended by, go and tap them and pray with them and offer forgiveness. This is where it starts, guys.